Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Patrick Hess, Planetarium Specialist at Union Station. Thanks for joining me for yet another stream, our 51st live stream. A couple quick notes before we start. My voice may sound a little hoarse. That's because I was cheering very loudly at the Chiefs game last night. I assure you I'm feeling good, but uh, it was a more stressful game than I thought it was going to be, so that's why my voice is a little hoarse. I don't know if you can hear that, but... Uh, thanks for uh, joining us yet again. Uh, if you're a first-time watcher, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Uh, and uh, don't forget that all of our previous streams, if you missed any of them, are available to re-watch on our YouTube channel. And if you're a returning watcher, welcome back. I know we have a couple uh, diehard fans who are probably here watching, so shout-outs to them. Uh, and don't forget that this is a live stream, so we're coming in live this Monday night. And if you have any questions or comments or shout-outs, want to say hi, tell us where you're watching from. We love hearing that. Uh, then be sure to uh, pop those in the uh, comments section of this stream and we will keep track of that uh, and I will try to answer any questions uh, as they pop up so uh, thanks for uh, tuning in I'm just uh, making sure I'm jumping in to the comments looks like we may have one comment uh, from this time maybe from last night. I think it's from this time from Casey saying uh, yay my favorite stream of the week hello Patrick and Union Station thanks for watching Casey if you're here with us right now I'm so glad you're joining us again uh, so, uh, welcome back. Uh, as a reminder, uh, Union Station is open to the public, so while uh, I have been having a ton of fun this whole year giving uh, you these live streams virtually, uh, don't forget that you can come visit us at Union Station and of course at the Planetarium. If you'd like to come see one of our live star tours in person, uh, you can buy tickets online. Of course, we're following all the safety protocols. And of course, there's tons of other holiday uh, decorations and activities happening at Union Station and Science City. So if you're looking for some place to be uh, and looking for a safe place to be as well, uh, we hope you feel comfortable comfortable come checking us out because of course buying a ticket to the planetarium is a great way to support us in addition to watching these live streams uh, now today's deep dive will be all about the distant ice worlds the ice giant planets uranus and neptune it's getting a little bit chillier outside so i figured we round out our uh tour of the solar system which we've been doing over the course of the whole year uh, with the final two planets before we jump into that though I do want to go over some space news, and unfortunately the biggest news story that broke this week uh, was just a few days ago, uh, and that was that the uh, Arecibo Observatory uh, in Puerto Rico did fully collapse, unfortunately. So let's go ahead and pull out uh, this news story here is coverage from NPR. Uh, so we've been uh, covering this over the past few weeks. Uh, there were some structural failures uh, in parts of the uh, cables holding this uh, radio telescope array up. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, these uh, the cables had complete structural failure, uh, and just the other day they did fully collapse. So there is actually footage of this collapse uh, captured uh, by uh, people there. There were nobody, there was nobody on site, so there were no injuries. But uh, it's very unfortunate. You know, this telescope has has been providing amazing imagery uh, for the past half century, uh, and it was instrumental in a lot of our discoveries. Um, about uh, near-Earth objects, objects that were passing by Earth that could have gotten too close to us. Uh, so its uh, loss will definitely be felt in the astronomical community, and there really aren't any other observatories uh, of that size that are looking at a similar wavelength. There are other larger uh, telescopes, uh, telescopes with larger arrays or apertures, but they don't quite look at the same type of imagery as Arecibo, so definitely will be sad. Arecibo also featured in a bunch of movies. Uh, I was in uh, the James Bond film, uh, forget which one, but it was a Pierce Brosnan film. Uh, and uh, it also was sending a, uh, a message out into space called the Arecibo message, uh, which was uh, one of the messages that I covered uh, in a previous stream uh, quite a while ago uh, on May 13th. That would be the stream where I covered the golden record and other messages we've sent to space, as well as our space probe stream on uh, April 29th. Uh, so uh, the Arecibo Observatory was one of the ways we were trying to communicate uh, with outer space, so another uh, definite loss there in the community. So poor one out for Arecibo. Uh, again, nobody was hurt, but unfortunately its science mission has concluded. Before we jump into the topic, let's jump back into the comments. We've got Robin tuning in from Australia. Wow, Robin, thanks for watching. What time is it over there? I hope, uh, hope you didn't wake up too early or stay up too late to watch us, but that's amazing. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you enjoy this stream. 
Uh, Jennifer's watching from Leewood, Kansas, a little bit closer to home. Thanks for tuning in anyway, Jennifer. Uh, and Chris is saying hello again, one of our longtime watchers, top fans. Thanks for tuning in. Excited to learn. Well, hopefully you learned something today. And Casey says, uh, if your voice isn't hoarse today, then you aren't a true Chiefs fan. That's right, Casey, exactly. I'm just glad that I had uh, something good to cheer about. So we got a lot of people tuning in. Uh, Ralph watched from Aurora, Colorado, and Dennis uh, says, Space Station overhead, 6.15 tonight. Ooh, that's a good thing to bring up. Um, uh, let's see here. Now, we talked about the International Space Station uh, in a previous stream. That would be our October 19th live stream. I actually built a model of the International Space Station out of Legos, uh, and we talked about all the different parts. Um, but if you are uh, wanting to spot the station yourself, you definitely can. It orbits the Earth once every 90 minutes, uh, and it will cover different parts of the world at different times, and it will be uh, it will be bright or dimmer depending on its angle to the sun. But uh, spotthestation.nasa.gov. Um, again, that's spotthestation.nasa.gov is NASA's own website that'll help you uh, find uh, the International Space Station. So there's a live tracking map. You can also get text alerts uh, when the International Space Station is above your location. And so uh, let's see. Oh, here's the tracker. Uh, so yeah, it looks like it is on its way to uh, crossing over North America here. Uh, so you might be able to catch that tonight, definitely. Um, all right. And then uh, Eric is watching from Lenexa, says break leg. Thanks, Eric. Matt is watching from Lake Viking, Missouri. Awesome. Uh, and Teresa says hello from Joplin, Missouri. Thank you for tuning in, Teresa. Got a question from Ali uh, saying, what is the difference in a refractor and reflector telescope? That's a great question, Lee. Uh, and uh, the main difference is how it focuses the light. So uh, a refracting telescope, refracting, uses uh, lenses to bend and focus the light. And a reflecting telescope uses mirrors to bend and focus the light. Uh, and I'm glad you brought that up because we did a whole live stream about telescopes uh, all the way back in May, May 6th. I did a live telescope setup and tutorial uh, actually just in my living room back here. Uh, so if you want to learn more about setting up and using telescopes, I used a reflecting telescope in that case. But I did talk about refractors and went over the mechanics of how they're different. So if you want to learn more about that, uh, Lee, then uh, for sure check out that live stream. Again, you can find all of our past streams on YouTube. Just search for Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium on YouTube. Uh, and that one will be, again, the May 6th uh, live stream. So don't forget, if you have any questions or comments, be sure to pop those in the comment section. Uh, and we're going to move on, but I will stop back to the comments uh, throughout tonight's stream. So we'll uh, tune in uh, and uh, check out anybody who uh, is going to ask anything from this point on. So don't be afraid to ask any questions or give any shout outs. We'll uh, check out the comments in just a few minutes. But we're going to dive into the uh, extreme outer reaches of our solar system far far away beyond mars uh, all the way past the storms of jupiter the rings of saturn things are very different way out there in the far reaches of our solar system and that's why i wanted to do this live stream all about this topic you know when we get far enough away from the sun temperatures obviously plummet uh, and the distances between between worlds at this scale are measured not in millions but billions of miles there's a really cool visualization that um, i brought up last week and it's worth bringing up again this is a uh, um, a cool visualization uh, put together where it basically uh, takes the whole solar system and it maps it out to scale, uh, basically imagining if the moon were just one pixel on your computer screen. Uh, and so this is just a very uh, tediously accurate map of the solar system. I think that's what the creator actually calls it. Uh, so we can fly over here uh, to Earth and you can see the scale of Earth and the moon here. The moon uh, being the size of a pixel. And then you can literally just scroll for miles and miles and there are little uh, little vignettes and bits of information throughout here so you could spend an entire afternoon just kind of strolling through our solar system here uh, but this just give, gives you a sense of the scale of uh, the separation the scale of things out in our solar system so I'll let you explore that we can post a link to it uh, in the comment section but a really fun visualization oh, we just passed by uh, one of the planets oh there's Uranus the first planet we're gonna stop by today um, but oh I did it again didn't I all right Wow it's, uh, we're good we're Doing really well tonight. You probably didn't see any of that because I had it on the wrong screen. Uh, so again, <laughs> just in case you didn't see that, again, we're doing this live, folks. Um, <laughs> this, as I was uh, talking about, and you probably couldn't see, uh, it, this is a website imagining if the moon were one pixel. And so you can just basically scroll through the entire solar system to scale. And it has all the planets mapped out to scale as well, along with those cosmic distances. So scrolling all the way over to Earth, you can see 
uh, the Earth and the Moon. The Moon is 240,000 miles away, uh, but even at this scale, it's pretty close compared to the whole uh, scale of our solar system. So there you can see we're just whizzing by all the planets here. So again, sorry that we missed that, folks, but uh, again, we can post a link to this. You can explore that for yourself, and I'll try to do a better job of making sure you guys see what I'm talking about on my screen. So uh, there's another uh, just a map of the scale of the entire solar system, and this also helps us to uh, kind of get a couple rules of thumb for imagining cosmic uh, distances, at least in our solar system. Uh, there are different units of measurement, of course. There are miles, thousands, millions of miles. There are also light years, the distance light can travel in a year, uh, but that's pretty far uh, in the scale of our solar system. So at a solar system scale, we use a measurement called an astronomical unit, or an AU. And that is basically just the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So when we're measuring things at this scale, it's uh, kind of nice to compare between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, and uh, that gives us sort of a, a way to visualize these distances. And, and there's some nice round numbers uh, we can use. Of course, they're not, ex they're not exact, but it's a good way to kind of imagine in your mind the scale. So uh, if one AU, one astronomical unit, is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, then Mars is at about one and a half AUs, one and a half times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. The asteroid belt is about two and a half AUs, and then Jupiter is five AUs. So Jupiter is five times as far away from the Sun as the Earth. Going out to the next planet, Saturn is 10 AUs, so it's twice as far as Jupiter, and 10 times as far as the Earth. And then next is Uranus, which is at about 20 AUs, which is twice as far as Saturn, four times as far as Jupiter, uh, and uh, 20 times as far as the Earth. So you can see how the scale gets very, very large, and then Neptune at around 30, and Pluto close to 40 astronomical units. So way out here in the far reaches of our solar system are where some of the most mysterious planets lie. Uranus, a pale blue model, uh, marble hanging in the dark frozen depths of space, and Neptune, the solar system's final true planet. And we are going to head out into the darkness together tonight. Uh, let's check in on the comments. Hopefully people were shouting at me for uh, how you couldn't see what I was showing you earlier. Lisa uh, says, hello. Uh, Glenn asks, how can you tell where the planets are in the night sky? That's a great question, Glenn. Uh, so I brought this up on a couple of my... Um, my star tour live streams but when you're looking at objects in the sky there's a really easy way to tell the difference between a planet and a star now stars are so distant from earth that only a tiny amount of their light is able to pass uh, through our atmosphere and so that tiny speck of light becomes distorted uh, by our atmosphere and that's why stars appear to twinkle so when you look at a star you'll see it twinkling planets on the other hand are a lot closer than distant stars so a lot more of their light is reflected back towards earth earth so they appear as wider disks of light so they do not twinkle so when you look at an object in the sky if it's very bright, often planets are much brighter than stars, and if it is not twinkling, that's how you can tell it's a planet. Now, planets will not always be in the same place every night as well. Planets orbit the sun at their own pace. That's how they got their name. The word planet means wanderer in ancient Greek, so they appear to wander around our night sky and don't stay in the same place every night. Let's see, David uh, is asking, how many AUs from the sun to the Oort cloud? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, Let's uh, ask Google. <laughs> Some of these measurements I don't know off the top of my head, unfortunately. I wish I could just pull that out. So the Oort cloud uh, is a very, very distant region of space where um, uh, comets originate from. Uh, and this ranges uh, actually quite a while uh, from anywhere from 2,000 astronomical units to 200,000 astronomical units. So at these cosmic scale distances, we are way, way further away than the planets. So starting at 2,000 astronomical units. But that's a great question, David. Thanks for bringing that up. And we talk about the Oort cloud uh, as well as other uh, objects that are way, way far away. Uh, we call them trans-Neptunian objects, objects further than Neptune. Uh, during my, um, let's see... Looks like it was November 9th live stream where I talked about minor planets. Uh, so check that out if you want to learn more about things that distant. So let's go back and make sure I bring us back to the screen here. Um, where were we? So we're going to travel out in the darkness, like I said. Now, right now we live at a time where uh, our civilization has unprecedented reach. We have a near permanent presence at Mars, the red planet, both in orbit and on the surface. And we've sent spacecraft to pretty much all the other planets, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn, for extended periods of time. We've explored them, orbited them, and uh, photographed them in great detail. Uh, and here's a really cool graphic put together by National Geographic that shows uh, all the different missions we've sent to the other planets, quite a few of them. But once we get beyond Saturn, things become much more difficult. As we saw before, these distances are far more vast and travel times are measured not in months, but in years or even decades. 
Now, this means that we've only visited the outer planets, Uranus and Neptune, once. Each visit, uh, way out here, uh, that we travel into the unknown uh, is... Um, is well, the single visit we've only, we've only taken traveling far out into the unknown um, is uh, one that uh, is very fascinating and one we've, we've touched on a little bit in previous streams, but we're going to follow along a little bit more closely. Uh, and uh, when we travel to these distant planets, these spacecraft are often uh, traveling so fast that um, they only spend a few hours in those systems. So our knowledge of these planets is fairly limited. We've only visited them once and only for a few hours, let alone you know, like Saturn and Jupiter, which we've orbited for months, if not years. Uh, but, you know, the, although there's precious little data we have about these outer planets, um, we uh, are, have already started to begin to understand a lot of these mysteries, uh, a lot of the mysteries that these outer planets hold. So the main spacecraft that explored, uh, or the only spacecraft that explored Uranus and Neptune was Voyager. Now, specifically is Voyager 2. There were two Voyager probes. Uh, Voyager 1 and 2, although Voyager 2 was launched before Voyager 1. Kind of confusing. But both of these were built to explore the outer solar system. Voyager 1's primary mission was to explore Jupiter and Saturn. Um, and you can learn more about uh, the Voyager probe and other deep space probes during my uh, uh, April 29th stream. Uh, and I also covered uh, the messages that the Voyages, Voyager probes took to space aboard the Golden Record uh, during uh, the May 13th live stream. So the Golden Record is one of the most famous collections of messages we've sent to space. Uh, speaking of Arecibo from before. Uh, so check that out. Uh, again, that is the May 13th stream. You don't want to learn more about that. Um, so the Voyager 2 mission was the first mission uh, uh, that was actually able to explore these very distant planets. And it was only made possible actually by help from the other planets in our solar system. Um, each planet uh, in our solar system orbits at a different speed. And most of the time they're kind of scattered throughout uh, our solar system. But occasionally they are grouped close together. Actually, there's one grouping Excuse me, coming up at the end of this month, uh, the Great Conjunction on December 21st, which we will for sure talk about in future live streams uh, coming up soon. Uh, but uh, during the Great Conjunction and uh, later this month, Jupiter and Saturn will align. Uh, but once every 175 years, all of the outer planets align. And back in the late 70s, this happened. And this created a path uh, that uh, helped us to explore these outer uh, planets. And so, as you can see, both Voyager 1 and 2 used the other planets in our solar system as sort of catapults, slingshots, using their gravitational field to push them far out, uh, further out into space. So we didn't have to take as much fuel. Uh, we could use the gravity to assist in our, uh, our uh, trajectory planning there. We call it a gravity assist. Go figure. Uh, so the Voyager 2 probe was launched on August 20th, 1977. Again, that was six day 16 days before its twin, Voyager 1. Uh, it arrived at Jupiter in about two years, um, and Jupiter, uh, which is two and a half times more massive than all the other planets combined, gave Voyager 2 a huge gravitational kick, uh, so we can see it slingshotting past Jupiter there. It arrived at Saturn two years later, uh, and it passed by the jewel of our solar system there. Uh, that blue is Voyager 2 here. And that gave it another gravitational kick as it headed out towards the ice giants. And almost nine years after leaving Earth, Voyager 2 approached an entirely new class of planets that we had never explored before or never seen in depth. And those are, again, the ice giants. So let's talk about ice giants. Now, uh, gas giants and ice giants are two different classes of planets. And we used to group all of the outer planets into the single category of uh, gas giants. Uh, but in recent decades, our scientific understanding has evolved and we've learned that there are more differences between these two classes than there are similarities. And so we devised this other category of ice giants. And so we can see the ice giants here. Uh, this is a, a cross-section of uh, what both Uranus and Neptune are like. Now, uh, just like Jupiter and Saturn, again, there are some similarities. Um, Uranus and Neptune's upper atmospheres are composed of mostly hydrogen and helium gas, uh, just like our sun, in fact. But below that uh, atmosphere of gas lies a, a very weird subsurface. Uh, it's a, a, a mixture of exotic icy materials, um, methane, ammonia, and actually surprisingly water. Uh, water exists down there as well. Now we use the term ice in sort of a sciencey way. Ice refers to a volatile chemical compound with a freezing point uh, above um, 100 Kelvin or minus 280 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, now these compounds uh, were solid uh, when they were uh, incorporated in the planets during their formation, but today they exist as what we call a supercritical fluid. Uh, which is basically uh, a type of weird phase of matter that there's not there's a, like a weird 
it's a sort of a weird gray area between a liquid and a gas, as you can see on this chart. We're not going to get too deep into the physics of supercritical fluids or anything like that, but just just know that uh, these these ices, you know, these materials, chemical compounds, methanes, ammonias, and water as well, exist as this weird state of matter below the gaseous upper atmosphere. So the first planet that uh, Voyager Two visited, the first ice giant, was Uranus. And we're going to pop back over to Space Engine here, and where we have our lovely solar system. And we're going to pop on over to the seventh planet from the Sun, Uranus. And here it is. Now, Uranus was discovered and identified as a planet in 1781 by a Sir William Herschel. It was likely observed on numerous occasions before this, actually, but it was mistaken for a star back then. Uh, potentially, even Greek astronomer Hipparchus saw it in 128 BC. Uh, he did record the locations of a lot of stars, and um, some historians believe that one of the stars he recorded could have actually been Uranus. And it also shows up in the notes of other astronomers over the centuries, but it was never identified as a planet until Herschel. Uh, and Herschel recorded its orbital, per orbital trajectory and discovered that it was going around the sun rather than a fixed point like a star. Uh, Uranus is named after a uh, uh, Greek deity of the sky and grandfather of Zeus. Uh, this is the only planet that's named after a, a the Greek version of a god. All the other ones are named after their Roman counterparts. Uh, and unlike the other gas giants, uh, Uranus is almost featureless. Now here in our simulation, uh, we can see some features, but that's actually because I have a special camera mode turned on. Um, and it, it kind of reveals some of them, but it really just appears as sort of a featureless, a pale blue ball of gas, usually, in most of our uh, visualizations. Now, uh, for all the time Voyager 2 spent photographing Uranus, it only captured a total of 10 cloud formations. Um, and uh, here is uh, some imagery from Voyager. There we go. Uh, so this is uh, captured by Voyager 2 of the uh, Uranian clouds. Uh, and so you can see this is... Uh, digitally enhanced photographs so we can see some enhanced contrast um, uh, but the, not a lot of features on the surface of um, Uranus there. Now the reason it turns out is that Uranus is actually the coldest planet in the solar system. It has an average atmospheric temperature of minus 370 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, now uh, Voyager spent just six hours at Uranus. Uh, again it was flying so fast that it didn't have time to slow down in orbit. Um, but while it was there, it made a lot of interesting discoveries. Uh, for example, while it was there, it discovered a ring system. Uh, and here is an image uh, captured by the Voyager probe of these very faint rings. Now from Earth, we can't see them, uh, but here in Space Engine, they do very faintly show up. Uh, and they're easier to see if we angle this with the sun in the background. They'll kind of be illuminated through the sun there. Though we can see them this way as well. Hopefully they're showing up in your stream. I guess it depends on the resolution if I line them up. Just right, maybe they'll be appear brighter, maybe not. Anyway, Uranus has a very faint ring system. And the rings are so dark and faint that they're really difficult to see from here on Earth. Um, and uh, this is because they're uh, likely made of a very dark material that doesn't reflect a lot of light. Makes sense, right? Uh, so these aren't like Saturn's rings. Saturn's rings are composed mostly of water ice, which water ice is very reflective, so they're easier to see. And if you want to learn more about Saturn and its rings, you can check out the July 6th live stream where we did a deep dive all about Saturn. Uh, that was a super fun stream. Um, so these rings are extremely delicate and thin, unlike Saturn. Saturn's are uh, very, very thick and wide, uh, but uh, Uranus's are, are very, very tiny. And um, now this is odd because you'd expect over time the particles in these rings, these sort of mini ring systems, would collide and kind of spread out. That's why Saturn's rings are so thin, only 30 feet thick on average, but spread out over 175,000 miles. But these, these rings kind of are grouped together in these, these sort of thicker, clumpy uh, rings. Now, now, the answer as to why uh, these uh, Uranus's rings are like this and what is actually holding them together was like uh, together uh, like this was actually um, uh, figured out by Voyager as well. Voyager captured uh, this image, this image, there's this image there of uh, the outer ring. This is called the Epsilon ring, uh, and uh, it captured. Uh, in this photograph, two moons. Now, back then we didn't have names for them, but since then we have named uh, these two moons, the inner moon uh, Cordelia and the outer moon Ophelia. These are named after uh, characters from Shakespeare's plays. In fact, all of 27 of Uranus's moons are named after Shakespeare characters. 
Um, but these two moons are actually what are keeping the ring system intact and keeping it from spreading out and becoming uh, wider like Saturn's. Uh, Cordelia here on the inside it moves more slowly than Ophelia on the outside. So if there's a particle in this uh, epsilon ring that hits another one and kind of gets pushed towards, like inwards towards Uranus, uh, then Cordelia's gravitational pull will speed it up. It'll kind of slingshot it back out. And if uh, a particle in the ring system gets pushed outwards, then uh, Ophelia here will slow that particle down and push it back in. So uh, we actually call these moons shepherd moons. Uh, and they uh, are what keep uh, Uranus's moon system, uh, or sorry, ring system, uh, nice and neat. Uh, and uh, Uranus also, another weird thing about it, is that it orbits the sun in a very unique way. And this is a consequence of events that likely happened very long ago during the dawn of our solar system. Uranus actually orbits sideways. Uh, and it's kind of hard to see here, uh, but if I, uh, let's see, not sure I can put it up here, but you can see the rings, uh, the rings kind of reveal its orbital angle. So this is sort of the plane of our solar system here. And if you look at the rings, they orbit at a very, very slanted angle. I've got a better visualization of this here in my PowerPoint, so let's Check that out. All right, so here are the rotations of all of the planets. So um, now, like all the other planets, Uranus was formed uh, and born at the beginning of our solar system uh, from the cloud of gas and dust that was left over after the sun was formed. And all the planets that were formed, uh, they orbited, um, they uh, all the planets formed orbiting in the same counterclockwise direction as their primordial cloud of material. So all the planets are orbiting in the same direction. Now, almost all the planets rotate in the same counterclockwise direction, except for two of them. One of them is Venus, and the other is Uranus. Now, we talked about Venus again during our um, Solar System Inferno's live stream, which would have been on October 12th, if you want to learn more about Mercury and Venus. Um, but Venus and Uranus are unique because they orbit counter, or so they orbit clockwise, which is counter to the uh, orbital direction. Sorry, they rotate clockwise, which is counter to the orbital uh, the direction of counterclockwise that the planet orbits in. So they spin on their axes in the opposite direction that they orbit. Uh, and even weirder, Uranus is sideways. <laughs> so uh, if you look at orbit, uh, Uranus's uh, a rotation, its north pole is actually pointed almost parallel with the um, plane of our solar system. So it orbits perpendicular to the rest of the solar system. Now it's not known for certain why Uranus spins in this way, um, but it seems likely that at some point, probably during the first few million years of our solar system's existence, it was likely hit by another protoplanet uh, that sort of knocked it over on its side. Um, so uh, we actually uh, produced uh, modern computer simulations that verify this could have happened. And uh, that they also uh, verify that if this were to happen, the uh, moon system would likely orbit in the same way. I guess I, I can turn the moon orbits on here uh, and you can see the, moon, the moons of uh, Uranus orbit all sl uh, slanted sideways, uh, just like uh, Uranus does, and very unlike all of the other moon systems in our solar system. So uh, after Voyager 2 flew past Uranus, uh, it had an unthinkably gigantic distance to travel of about 1 billion miles of empty icy space before it got to its next destination, and that was Neptune. So time for us to check out Neptune. Ooh, though before I forget... Uh, let me jump into the comment section. Remember, this is live. If you have any comments, if you tuned in later in the stream, uh, I am watching live. So I would love to hear you guys. Uh, if you want to say hi, if you have a shout out, let us know where you're watching from. And if you have a question uh, about any of the topics uh, or just about life in general, I give great advice. And then feel free to put it in the comment section. So let's jump in here. Carl says, space station is visible now over Kansas, Kansas City. That's awesome. Cool. Um, I'm sorry I missed it. But again, it does pass over fairly frequently. And again, you can use those resources uh, to find it. It looks like KC saw the space station. That's awesome. Uh, I'm stuck in this pocket dimension, so unfortunately I missed it. But so glad some of you guys caught it. <laughs> it looks like Eric is saying that Granny is asking, why do we focus on Mars uh, for our next uh, crewed space target? And that's a quest great question, Granny. Uh, so why are we going to Mars? Now, I talk about that a lot more during my Mars live stream, so I don't want to spoil that too much. And unfortunately, we don't have time to dive into it in depth. But uh, basically... Mars is uh, very similar to the Earth in a lot of ways, and we think Mars in its distant past was even more similar. We think Mars was covered in oceans of liquid water. So exploring Mars and visiting it someday would potentially uh, help us to understand 
why Mars is no longer like Earth, because of course we would love Earth to stay the same and not turn into a planet like Mars. Uh, but also Mars just uh, is maybe the most convenient other place. It does have an atmosphere and it doesn't have as extreme of temperature changes as something like the moon does without an atmosphere or uh, it doesn't have extreme weather like Venus. So Mars is just kind of the next logical place that would probably be smart to go to. Eric also says, how do astronomers know uh, the strata of these distant objects? Uh, I'm not sure uh, exactly what uh, you mean by strata. So if you wouldn't mind clarifying more exactly what you're asking. Uh, and uh, let's see. And also Granny is asking, why is Uranus a planet if it's just a ball of gas? Uh, well, it's just a different type of planet. So actually most of the planets in our uh, galaxy that we think of are, are these gas giant planets. Uh, and these planets were likely on their way to becoming a star, but they never quite got big enough to ignite stellar fusion. Uh, David says, thanks for the presentation. Watching from Colorado Springs. Awesome. Thanks for watching again, David. I know you're uh, one of our uh, longtime watchers. I appreciate you. And Jennifer says, watching from Emporia. Thanks for tuning in. All right. So back to space engine and back to our solar system and back to the next stop that Voyager 2 took and the next stop on our stream today and that is Neptune the final planet in our solar system and Neptune uh, was likely recorded uh, and mapped out by Galileo in 1612 uh, when he plotted various objects that he saw through his telescope but back then he thought it was just a star and the story of how Neptune was discovered is kind of interesting. Uh, in 1821, uh, a man named Alexis Bouvard published uh, data tables about Uranus's orbit, uh, Uranus's orbit, which uh, he noted appeared to be affected by some unusual object. So mapping out Uranus's orbit, basically he did the math and he saw that the way Uranus was moving, it should be moving in a different way, but there seems to be something else affecting it, something pulling on it. And so Alexis basically said, Hmm, I think we should probably look for another planet out there because that would make sense if there was a planet pulling on Uranus. Uh, and so uh, another astronomer named John Couch Adams began looking for this eighth planet. Um, so uh, now I w it's kind of interesting I bring this up because uh, now, of course, Neptune is the eighth planet uh, and the final planet. Pluto is not a planet. Uh, and talking about why Pluto is not a planet, we've covered that in a bunch of different streams, but I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, but it, it, I wanted to bring this up because similar measurements have been made today uh, about Neptune's orbit. And so some scientists are now looking for a real ninth planet, a planet beyond Pluto that could be pulling on Neptune. So there's precedent uh, for this discovery, uh, potentially leading to a new planet being discovered. And this is how we found Neptune. There was actually a, another astronomer, a French astronomer na uh, named uh, Urbain Le Varier. I butchered that name, but in 1845, he developed his own calculations similarly and began searching. And today, both of these people were given credit for the eventual discovery of Neptune, the eighth planet. Now, as for Voyager, uh, it had taken 12 years, but Voyager did finally cross the vast expanse of space between Earth and this most distant planet, Neptune. Um, now, uh, Neptune is 17 times the mass of the Earth, even more massive than Uranus, in fact. Uh, but in contrast to its sister planet, Neptune is, uh, it has a very active atmosphere. So unlike Uranus, uh, which is mostly featureless, Neptune is covered in storms. It has a very, very uh, violent atmosphere full of extreme weather. Uh, high altitude winds in the upper atmosphere of Neptune uh, can whip the methane clouds up there at speeds of up to 1200 miles per hour. Uh, here is uh, some imagery captured by Voyager of a storm whipping around the clouds. Uh, this is actually a storm on the uh, southern hemisphere uh, of uh, Neptune and uh, similar to uh, Jupiter's giant storm, it was dubbed the Great Dark Spot. Uh, this storm uh, system was the size of the Earth, uh, but interestingly, when we looked back there with the, um, the Hubble Space Telescope a few years later, uh, we discovered that it had vanished. And since then, there have been other storms that have formed. So these storms are forming and dissipating much more quick quickly than the Great Red Spot on Jupiter or um, any other storm we see in the solar system. Uh, so why does a planet so far away from the sun with so little energy falling to it uh, through its atmosphere from the sunlight have such extreme uh, winds and weather? Uh, and it has the most extreme weather in our solar system, the fastest winds in our solar system. Well, a Voyager, let's go back over here to Space Engine. Voyager also discovered that although 
Uh, Neptune is further from the sun than Uranus. It is actually warmer than Uranus. So Uranus is the coldest planet in our solar system. But kind of like how like Venus is the hottest, even though it's not closest to the sun, Neptune is not the coldest, even though it's the furthest away, which is very weird. Now, the source of this extra heat remains a mystery. We do not know for sure. But for some reason, Neptune emits over two and a half times the heat that it receives from the sun. And this internal heat uh, helps to explain some of the extreme storms and weather. Um, now, uh, the probable reason as to why these winds can be so high is that there's no solid surface below these clouds of Neptune. So these winds have nothing to dissipate them, like mountains or other uh, features uh, that break up the flow of this wind. And so the wind just is able to whip constantly around this planet at supersonic speeds. Uh, now, uh, Neptune also has a very faint ring system as well. It's hardly showing up here on Space Engine, but if I line it up just right with uh, the sunlight, you might be able to just barely see it. Uh, the ring system of Neptune actually features in a movie that came out last year, I believe, called Ad Astra, uh, starring Brad Pitt. Uh, and speaking of movies, I did a live stream all about movies and uh, the science uh, and astronomy of movies and Hollywood. And that was uh, the July 20th live stream. So check that one out if you want to learn about movies and their scientific accuracy. Uh, that movie, Ad Astra, uh, did uh, actually, um, they explored Neptune. Uh, it took place around Neptune and actually... Uh, it took place around Neptune's rings, uh, and there was a moment in the movie where uh, Brad Pitt flew through the rings of Neptune uh, using just uh, basically a piece of cardboard to block his block himself from those particles. Uh, as to whether or not that could potentially happen, uh, you'll just have to tune in uh, to a future live stream because I do have a plan to revisit Hollywood because we didn't have enough time to cover all the movies I wanted to, and that Astro would for sure be on that list. Um, as well as The Martian. So if you guys are interested in watching another live stream about Hollywood, uh, doing a part two, so to speak, uh, of covering more movies, then po post in the comments so uh, we know that you're interested in that because I would love to love to bring that topic back next year. So uh, before Voyager continued its journey out into deep space, um, it, uh, it made one last stop. It stopped by one of Neptune's moons. Neptune has 14 moons in total. Uh, but it stopped by the moon Triton, which is right there. So let's take a little look at Triton, one of the moons of Neptune. Neptune's largest moon of those 14. All the moons of Neptune are named after various deities of the ocean. And this moon is covered in a, she a sheer layer of frozen nitrogen. Now, we would expect a moon this distant uh, to be a very silent and still world, like all of the... Uh, uh, distant objects and dwarf planets like Pluto. But Voyager was in for one last surprise before it left the Neptunian system. It discovered that Triton here was actually geologically active. There were geysers that were photographed by uh, the Voyager probe that launched uh, material up to five miles out into space. Um, and this carried, uh, the, these geysers carried materials, uh, these this material hundreds of miles downwind as well. So there were geysers on this very distant icy world. Now it turns out that uh, scientists think at least light from the distant sun was, sun was heating up a layer of darker material a few feet below the frozen nitrogen. Uh, and it was just enough energy to vaporize the nitrogen above it and create these geysers. So even in this, the farthest reaches of our solar system, the faint light from our sun is still powerful enough uh, to create distant geological wonders. And here is uh, sort of an artist's interpretation of what these geysers might look like on that frozen surface of Triton around the planet Neptune. So Triton uh, is also covered in tons of cracks, craters, and other tectonic features. Uh, now, uh, unlike uh, other large moons in the solar system, Triton orbits in the opposite direction to the spin of the planet. We've talked about that before and how that can definitely affect things. Uh, and so the most likely explanation then is that Triton was a captured moon, an object that was uh, passing by Neptune and was captured by its gravitational field. We see that in a lot of the moons of uh, Saturn and Jupiter. We've talked about those for sure in those uh, planet uh, live streams, so check that out. Uh, but essentially what likely happened is that there was an object uh, far away in the Kuiper Belt, probably beyond uh, the orbit of Neptune, uh, that was disturbed gravitationally and came inwards and then just co coincidentally kind of got uh, in the path of Neptune's gravitational field and got pulled in. Now when Triton was first captured, it would likely have uh, had an orbit that uh, was very elliptical and not circular like it is today. 
Uh, and as Triton uh, moved further away and closer in that elliptical orbit, it was likely pulled and pushed by Neptune's gravity. Uh, we call this uh, tidal heating. So what happened is all that force pulling and tearing on this moon uh, caused it to heat up and become geologically active. Uh, we see this uh, in the moon of Io around Jupiter. If you want to learn more about that, our Jupiter live stream was on uh, June 29th. Um, but uh, basically, uh, that is likely why Triton is so geologically active. Uh, that it was a captured object, maybe a comet uh, or another dwarf planet uh, that got pulled in um, by uh, Neptune and was just sort of pushed and pulled and, and just ripped apart uh, until it settled into that circular orbit and is still somewhat geologically active today. Uh, so when Voyager 2 left Neptune, it was destined to continue flying far out, uh, out of our solar system. If you want to learn about uh, its current location, uh, NASA has uh, a bunch of great resources. They have actually Twitter pages for both Voyager 1 and 2. The Voyager 2 Twitter page will post its uh, exact distance every few hours, which is kind of cool. It'll tell you how many light seconds away it is, because um, that's the scales that we're, they're working at. Uh, or actually, it's light hours, how many hours of light travel it is away. Um, and then there's also this great program called NASA Eyes, which is a free program you can download. Um, let me load it up here. You can put this program on your computer, uh, and it is a great resource um, to uh, to learn more about space. Uh, so we can go into the eyes on the solar system. There are a lot of different modules uh, all about uh, different topics, but if we go to our solar system, uh, whoop, it's weird. Let's bring it back. Um, it's going to have a sort of a kind of like the software we were using before, but just a bit simpler uh, and NASA themed. Um, but this has all the planets, and you can click on uh, planets, and it will. Uh, tell you more about them and you can explore them in detail uh, so you can look at different features of these planets um, but it also has many uh, interesting probes and so we can actually zoom out here and we can see Voyager 1 and 2 so we can actually visit Voyager 2 here we're going to zoom way in it's got a lovely 3D model so you can see all the different parts of the Voyager probe and we can see how far away it is from our solar system so let's zoom way back out here again a lot of scrolling there we go so we can see it is well on its way out of our solar system. In fact, uh, in, uh, let's see, when was it? November of 2018, NASA announced that the Voyager 2 probe had left the solar system. Voyager 1, its sister probe, had left in 2012. And so now these two Voyager probes are the most distant man-made objects, and they are exploring beyond our solar system. They are in interstellar space. Uh, so check out NASA Eyes, a uh, really great program. You can uh, learn all about and different probes and again we clicked on Voyager it gives us information about it with a link to explore more so there we have it the ice giants these distant mysterious worlds Uranus and Neptune and with that we are kind of rounded out with our whole tour of the solar system way way back um, what feels like a thousand years ago our very first deep dive live stream which was on April 8th I did a general solar system tour where I covered all the planets very quickly but since then I've been going back and revisiting the planets uh, and we have been uh, checking out all of uh, the um, uh, or many of the planets and other objects in our solar system uh, by the way if you have any questions now is your last chance to put those in because we are about to wrap up so if you have any questions we will uh, check out those uh, or comments or shout outs uh, there's just a little bit of time left so like I said, we've covered much of our solar system on, uh, let's see, when was it? October 12th, we covered the solar system infernos, Mercury and Venus. On August 10th, we talked about Mars, the red planet. On June 29th, Jupiter, we did a whole stream about. And then July 6th, we did a stream about Saturn. Today, we did Uranus and Neptune, and those are all of the... Uh, eight planets in our solar system besides the Earth, of course. I did a stream on my top 10 moons where we talked about the moons of our solar system. That was on September 14th. And then on November 9th, I did a stream about minor planets, which includes a lot of different categories of objects in our solar system, like the dwarf planets, uh, as well as asteroids and comets and all sorts of things like that. We did a stream all about comets on July 13th. I actually made a comet using materials uh, that you can buy at a grocery store. So check out the July 13th live stream if you want to learn how to make your own comet at home. And we talked about asteroids and other uh, space surprises, objects that can get a little close to comfort close for comfort uh, to the Earth. That was the August 31st live stream. So what's left? I've covered just about everything. Well, there are a couple things that are left. Uh, during our minor planet stream, we skipped one dwarf planet, 
particularly we skipped Pluto because at the time I said that I wanted to do a stream about Pluto specifically and so we actually have scheduled that I've scheduled that stream for our first live stream of the new year in 2021 so on January 4th we are going to cover Pluto the last sort of stop in our solar system uh, and I do have plans to cover Earth in some capacity in the future, since, of course, Earth is a planet, although it is my least favorite planet, um, if I'm being honest. Uh, but we'll be doing that next year if we continue these streams. Uh, but just to give you a little overview for the rest of uh, this year, we have um, our uh, next live stream next week on the 14th of uh, December here. We're going to be talking about orbital mechanics and rockets. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about what it takes to get to orbit and the different mathematical things that go into that. And we'll be using a very fun visualization. I've got a piece of simulation software that'll let us build our own rockets and test them out. It's called Kerbal Space Program. If anybody's tried that out, hopefully you'll enjoy that stream. It should be a lot of fun. We're going to launch our own rockets into space. Uh, and then the following week, that Monday, the 21st, is the Great Conjunction. That is when Jupiter and Saturn align. So that night, we are not going to do a live stream because I'm going to be outside with my telescope somewhere checking that out for myself. Uh, but we will be doing a stream uh, probably before that uh, where we will uh, talk about how you can see it best, uh, give you some tips for that. And also uh, during that stream, I'm going to give a winter star tour. So we're going to give a little uh, what's up stream, uh, harkening back to the old days earlier this year when we did those uh, those star tours. And it's going to be a winter star tour. So I'm going to tell you all what we can see uh, during our winter skies, since that day will also be the official start of winter, the shortest day of the year, the winter solstice. Uh, so uh, again, that'll probably be a few days before the 21st. So just keep track of our Facebook page. Uh, that is the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium on Facebook, um, where uh, we will post when you can expect that live stream. The following week, uh, on the 28th, we're going to do a, a review of this year in space. We're going to talk about all the space discoveries and announcements and news that happened in the world of space travel and exploration and astronomy. So that'll be a nice retrospective covering everything that we have learned this year in astronomy. And then again, the week after that, the 4th of January, first stream of the new year will be on Pluto. So hopefully that sounds good to you all. And we're going to check back into the comments for our final questions and comments. Uh, Tammy, tuning in, one of our longtime watchers. Thanks for watching, Tammy. Says, thank you for still doing these. We really appreciate it and enjoy them and you every week. Well, I appreciate you tuning in every week, Tammy. Thanks so much for continuing to support uh, what I do and for supporting Union Station. Looks like AB is saying, uh, thank you for doing this. Thanks for watching. And David uh, said, yes, please cover The Martian. Yes, I will for sure be talking about that when we do our future Hollywood live stream. Okay, a couple last second questions. Eric says, how do astronomers, oh, so the, oh, the layers. Ah, I see. Oh, <laughs> I'm guessing Eric may have some experience in geology. Uh, that's something I'm a little less experienced in. And so Eric originally asked, how do the astronomers know the strata of these distant objects relating uh, specifically to the layers and the core, so the, the internal structure of these objects? And the answer is we don't really know. Um, we uh, are able to get some uh, some scientific data by uh, you know sending a radar and other uh, other imagery from uh, probes like Voyager or Cassini around Saturn or Juno around Jupiter. Uh, but we don't know a lot. You know we can make inferences based on observations we make on the uh, the upper atmospheres of these planets, and of course we can do simulations. Um, but it's basically just our best guess, our best hypothesis based on what we know about physics, about how different materials interact with each other, how they behave in extreme conditions. Because again, I talked about supercritical fluids. We know that there are extreme pressures inside these massive planets. And so we can use our understanding of physics that we glean from, uh, from scientific study here on Earth to make inferences about what is likely going on in these distant planets. Uh, but that's a really great question, Eric. And the answer is we don't truly know. It's just, it's science. You know, we make our best guess. And as we learn more, we evolve our understanding. Casey asks, are there any plans to revisit the ice giants? That's a great question, Casey. There are no current plans from NASA that I'm aware of uh, to send probes to these distant worlds. Um, and that includes Pluto as well. We did visit Pluto in 2015. The New Horizons spacecraft passed it by. But um, after that, I'm not aware of any uh, deep space probes that are planning on visiting these ice giants quite yet. Hopefully those plans will come sometime soon. Uh, David asked, do Voyager 1 or Voyager 2 have destinations that they are targeting now and moving forwards? I believe they do. Um, uh, we can uh, look it up real quick. Um, you know, as with many of these missions, there are the primary missions uh, where NASA just hopes that they accomplish their primary mission target. Uh, but over uh, once they accomplish that target, we, we're not just going to turn the probe off. Of course, it's still working. Uh, so... Um, you know, we want to, a lot of times they'll think of new destinations for these distant probes. Uh, and so the Voyager 2, uh, let's see, it's not heading towards any particular star. Uh, in roughly 42,000 years, it'll pass uh, within uh, 1.7 light years from a star Ross 248. Uh, but it's pretty far away and it's going to be... Uh, 
really not really heading towards anything in particular. Um, so, you know, we're still uh, still learning about the outer reaches of our solar system, gathering data from beyond uh, the heliopause, the distant most distant reaches of radiation from the sun. Um, but uh, it looks like uh, they have do they do have plans in uh, this year? I guess they planned to. Uh, adjust the power profile to uh, allow some of the instruments to continue operating. I guess they're still doing it. Uh, but around 2025, it looks like they are planning on uh, no longer being able to, being able to power uh, any of the instruments, unfortunately, for Voyager 2. And uh, Voyager 1, I'm assuming, probably has a similar... Uh, yeah, around 2025 to 2030, uh, it will lose power as well. And next year, they're going to start shutting down instruments aboard Voyager 1. So unfortunately, it looks like this uh, these... You know, nearly 50 year missions will be coming to a conclusion at some point just as these uh, probes start failing. But that's a great question, David. Um, and uh, <laughs> Eric is saying that Granny is asking why Pluto isn't a planet anymore. Uh, and uh, to answer that question, uh, I will uh, just go ahead and use that as a teaser for the end of our stream because we will be answering that question in depth during our Pluto live stream on January 4th. So check that out if you want to learn more about why Pluto isn't a planet. Uh, and our last few shout outs, uh, Chris says, thank you so much for the amazing live stream presentation. Thanks for being amazing and watching, Chris. Uh, Amy says, I love your flag. Oh, that, cool. Uh, no, I believe we posted a link uh, in the comments if you want to download this cool uh, spacey flag for yourself. Uh, Eric says, great show. Thanks for watching as always, Eric. And Stephanie says, looking forward to Pluto. Thanks as always. And that does bring us to the conclusion of our live stream today. Once again, I have been Patrick Hess, your planetarium specialist. Don't forget, come visit us at the planetarium in person if you do feel comfortable. If not though, check us out once again, same place, same time, same website, same live stream uh, this coming Monday next week at six o'clock. We will be diving into orbital mechanics using Kerbal Space Program. For now, I'm gonna sign off. Hope you all have a fantastic week and we will see you soon. Bye everyone.